Hey everybody, and welcome back to Hunters Connect. My name is Luke Cacoli. I'm the Director of Conservation Programs for the Boone and Crockett Club. We're here today with Justin Spring, the Director of Big Game Records at the club's Rasmussen Wildlife Conservation Center on the Theodore Roosevelt Memorial Ranch. And we're going to teach you how to score a whitetail buck. Now whether you're a new hunter or an experienced hunter, whitetail deer are one of the most popular big game species to pursue. So if you're lucky enough to harvest one, you're probably going to want to know how to score it. Now we're going to start taking all these measurements with pencil and when we have an official score and all our math checks out, we'll, we'll finish this up in pen. But for now, we're, we'll stick with the pencil. So we're going to start from the top here and work down through the score chart. Um, you'll see on the, uh, on the score chart, the first box, A, number of points on right antler. That is simply a count of the number of points on the right antler is going to be the deer's right side, not if you're looking at it. So this is the right antler. Um, for a point to be, for a projection to be considered a point, it needs to be at least one inch long and the length must exceed the width at one inch or more. So there, there's, again, on the website, there's better definitions there, but basically it needs to be an inch long. And we're just going to count how many are on here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five on the right. And then on the left, one, two, three, four, five points on the left. The next box is box B, which asks for the tip to tip spread. When we do the tip to tip, it is simply the center of the tip of one antler to the center of the tip on the other. It's taken directly, you know, through there. So Luke's gonna demonstrate here with the slide rule. inside of that tip to the inside of the tip. I've got seven inches here on my wooden portion of the ruler with the sliding extension out. I see I've got three inches and three eighths. So that comes to a total of 10 and three eighths inches tip to tip measurement. All our measurements on whitetail are going to be done in eighths. If the measurement lands on a 16th, on the 16th or higher round up, below the 16th round down. Our next measurement is going to be the greatest spread. Um, neither tip to tip or greatest are figured into the score, but we do record them. The, the record book is a wildlife data set. It's not purely just to get a ranking by any means. And so these are useful data points that we do want taken correctly if something's going to be entered, but when filling out a score chart correctly, you need that. So what we're gonna do for the tip, for the uh, greatest spread, you can use uh, a C clamp at a level, if you have two of them, this works fine. I like to use a, a, a wider flat surface like this so I can make sure that my furthest outward projection is there. I'm going to square up this rack so that the axis of the skull is parallel to the edge of this wall. We're then going to take this and make sure, make sure that our level is level. Touch it on the greatest, greatest projecting outside edge. Measure that distance from all there. This one lands at 18 and 3 16 So we're gonna round that up to 2 8 18 and 2 8 Okay. Our next measurement is D, inside spread of main beams. The main beam on a white tail starts down here and comes out here to the front, out here to the front. These can turn down, they can turn up, but this is the general configuration of, of a main beam. So the inside spread of main beams must be taken from the center of the beam to the center of the beam. On a white tail, you can see it's usually gonna be somewhere in this, in this area. Each deer may have a little different beam configuration, but the, the most common place we're going to get that is this wide spot here about the G2. So again, I'm going to use that sliding, sliding ruler. I make sure my point of contact is in the center of the beam. And then I'm going to work this up and down, finding the widest point 
from the center of the beam to the center of the beam, again, perpendicular to the axis of the skull. So we're gonna be right there. We've got 16 and four eighths. So you'll notice on the score chart, it says spread credit may equal but not exceed the longer main beam. We don't know what our longer main beam is yet. Um, but so for now, we're just gonna leave that. We'll leave that block blank until we get on to E, which is total length of abnormal points. This is a typical deer with, with no abnormals. Boone and Crockett has a typical category that is recognizing the most common form of a white-tailed deer. You know, the tines come up, they come off all off the same outside top edge of the beam on the same plane, both sides. Anything that would break outside of this typical form would be considered an abnormal. If we have a tine coming off the side, if we have something coming off the bottom, that is not the, the, the typical configuration, so that would be an abnormal point. So this one has zero abnormal points, so we are gonna mark in those boxes zeros to, to note that we've looked at abnormals and there's none there. Our next is F, length of main beam. The length of main beam is best taken with a uh, flexible steel cable and the circuit clip. You can also use an alligator clip. Um, basically just something that you can get a precision stop point on when measuring this. So when we're doing a whitetail, your starting point is in the center of the beam. The way that we determine that is we hold this, this rack out and basically hide this side by the front side so you know you're looking at it square and then you find the exact center point of this beam. When you hook on your uh, flexible steel cable, you don't push it down, you just hook, you hook the lip end right under the edge of burr. That continues up the center and slowly transitions to this outside edge. Now we're gonna actually tape this on, but that's what we're trying to do. All right, so I've put on my, uh, my length of beam, we've taped it. Now you can see here, as it comes through here, we need to stay in the middle of this beam. One real, real good trick that, that we like to use is we want to put our baselines on these tines because if we identify the base of these tines, that's going to be the top of the beam. Then you can see the top, the bottom, and you can make sure that this cable is staying right in the middle. So we're going to go through and by using this cable, we are going to set it across the top of the antler material. The baseline is going to depict where this beam would be had this tine never happened, okay? So you're not, if you're taking the tine length, you're not gonna include any of the beam, but you wanna include the whole tine. So again, the bases are where the beam would be had this tine or this tine or this tine not happened. So we'll go ahead and position that flexible steel cable along the top edge of the main beam, marking with pencil on the masking tape on the bottom edge of that flexible cable each baseline for each projection. You know, and one thing to note, uh, when, you get, when you get back on this, you can see how this beam's curving. Our line should parallel the under edge. If we cut that straight across, we're gonna incorrectly increase this length of time. So when we put our baseline on, we need the curve of the line here to match the curve of the beam underneath. Again, if that beam was here and the tine was not, it would not be straight across there. So now we can see that we've stayed in the center. We have our baselines on. We're gonna take this out to the tip of the beam. Take our circuit clip, mark the end of the main beam length, and now transfer this flexible cable along our carpenter ruler. 19 and five. So our next measurement is G1, length of first point. And G1 is just because we're on letter G. There's no special meaning to that. That's why G1 is called a G1. We're on letter G on the score chart. So when you're taking a G1, um, they, can, they can come forward or backward. 
The length of tine is always along the greatest outside curve. Now we can't take it from the top or the bottom, but the front side center or the back side center is appropriate. So we're gonna put on our masking tape on both sides. And then we're gonna draw our baselines on the front and the back. Since this one's pretty straight up, we're not sure which the longer outside curve's gonna be, so we're gonna to have to check them both. All right, so kind of eyeballing it, it looks to me like the front's gonna be the longest, so I'm gonna measure that one first. I'm starting in the very center of the tine on my baseline, and I'm staying right in the center of the projection up to the tip that'll be marked with the clip. Now if the, you'll see better on the other side, but if there's a curve in the, in the G1 tine, you still stay right in the center. So we've got this marked. I'm now gonna use this to test the back to see which is longer. Placing this again in the center, I follow it up to the tip. And indeed the front side is the longer G1 greatest outside curve, so we're going to record this. Four and three eighths. All right, our next one is going to be our G2, so we're on our second normal point. We've drawn that baseline on. Remember when we did that when we were figuring where the center of our beam was, so we have our baseline already. I'm going to place the, the uh, cutoff into the cable right snug against my baseline. And again, staying in the center of the projection, we're gonna follow this up along that outside curve to the tip. G3 tine, so the third normal tine, G1, 2, G3, same thing. I'm gonna put the edge of this right snug against my baseline in the center of the projection. It is then going to come up the middle to the tip of the projection. And that's gonna be eight and four eighths. Our last time, G4, same procedure. Tip of the cable against the baseline, staying in the center of the projection along that curve. To the tip. That is four and seven eighths. Now on these, similar to the G1 where we check the front and the back, if one of your G2, 3, 4, if, it, if the curve is to the outside, you take the outside curve. So it may be appropriate to come along the inside, but you can see on this deer, on this buck, all of them are curving in. So your greatest outside curve were all on the outside. That's why we took those. Now, once we have the length of those tines, You'll notice on the score chart, there's additional lengths of G tines. There is no maximum number of normal points that can happen on a white-tailed deer. They just must all come off the top outside edge of the beam um, and further out. But in this case, we have one, two, three, four. So we have a G4. This is not scored as a G tine. We already took the length of this projection for the beam. So this is a beam. So one, two, three, four, and then the fifth point. So now we are going to move on to the H measurements, which, is our, which are the circumferences. You'll notice on the score chart, it tells you where the circumferences must be taken. So H1 circumference at smallest place between burr and first point. So the burr and the first point. We take our ring in clip or ring in tape that, is, that has a uh, offset zero point, wrap it around. Then we work it up and down between that burr and G1 looking for our smallest circumference, which is gonna be right down here, which is four and one eighth. Our H2 circumference is gonna be between first and second point. So the same procedure is used. Wrap it around, 
work it up and down looking for that smallest circumference, this one is also going to be 4 and 1 8. H3 circumference between the 2 and the 3 is going to be 3 and 6 eighths. Then the H4 circumference between the 3 and the 4 is going to be 3 and three-eighths. Now, a, a very common misconception is that you might get an additional circumference if there's more normal points. That is not correct. A white-tailed deer always has four circumferences regardless of the number of points. If this is missing a point out here, if it's only got a G1, 2, 3, your last circumference is taking at the midpoint of this time to the beam tip. If say, for example, the G1 never happened and it's just smooth all the way here, both H1 and H2 are gonna be the smallest place between Burr and G2. And again, Luke had said the, the manual's there and there's reference online, that goes over all this. But remember, no matter the number of points, you're always going to have four circumferences per side on a whitetail. So now that we've got through the circumference measurements, we're gonna switch up here and go through on the left side. All right, so on the left side, we're gonna go through and put our tape where the baselines are gonna be. So again, we use, we use the flexible steel tape so that we can get it right on that beam material and make sure that the, the line is reflecting what the off side of the beam is doing as well. Then I'm going to draw my line on the bottom edge of that steel cable. We use the masking tape and pencil technique, not only because we don't want to draw on someone's trophy horns or antlers, but also it provides reference points for in the future when we take this main beam length to make sure we're right in the middle of all that antler material. And again, this, this underside of this beam is curved, so I need to reflect that in my baseline. This beam, had this point not happened, would have a curve in this line, so it's not correct to come straight. You need to parallel this under edge on your baseline. All right, so now we have our baselines on that we're gonna use for point length and also as our reference as we put on the beam length. We're gonna use the same technique as we did on the other side, extend it out, hiding that off antler behind this side so I can easily identify the center of the beam here. Our flexible steel cable is hooked just under the burr. It is not pushed down in, it's just hooked under the edge there and it slowly transitions right up the center of this beam. And we make sure that we're centered as we come all the way out through here. We're gonna go ahead and tape this on just so you can see where that, where that line needs to go here. Now you'll notice on the tip of this one, this buck has broken the tip of his antler off. We are going to take this measurement to the very furthest piece of antler material there. We cannot assume it was further. You measure what's there, so you mark it right at the very end of that if it's broken. You can see here how we stayed in the center using our baselines as reference all the way out to the tip. We'll again, take our flexible steel cable stretch it along our carpenter ruler and transpose our measurement 16 and 6. On this G1 we're going to use the same technique as on the other side where we place this end of the cable in the very center of it. Now you notice this G1 has a curvature to it. 
so it's going to take a little bit of finagling, but I need to stay in the middle of this projection on this outside curve. We've got four and one eighth. We're going to use the same technique on these other G tines, snug against our baseline, staying in the center. Now, if you have a very straight tine such as this one, some majors do prefer to hook the uh, lip end tape on that and then bring it down to the baseline. This is appropriate as well, but I greatly prefer using this flexible steel cable because as you can see on these tines, they generally have a curve and a rotation of the tape will not yield an accurate measurement unless it's very straight. So this one stays right in the center from the tip. We are two and five eighths. Again, we're gonna do our circumferences where it uh, tells us to on the score chart. So H1 is going to be between Burr and G1. We find the smallest place is going to be four and one eighth. And again, remember on whitetail, there's always four circumferences. If you have a spike, all four circumferences would be taken in the center point of the spike. So there's always a way to get four, never any less, never any more on a whitetail. All right, so now that we have all of our measurements, we're gonna go ahead and add up column one, column two. We'll subtract the differences to fill in column three. We're gonna go ahead and plug all those in that bottom left corner of our score sheet. But first we've gotta add spread credit. Now spread credit can sound a little bit confusing, but basically what that's gonna be is our inside spread of the main beams, unless that is greater than the longest main beam, in which we would just enter the longest main beam length as our spread credit. So as Luke's going through and adding this score up, in this particular case, since the deer has no abnormal points, this subtotal is going to be what folks refer to as a gross score. Should it have any abnormals, they would be added into that number as well. And then for Boone and Crockett, all of our ranking is done off final scores. The difference in the left to right um, antlers and, and the abnormal points are caused by stressors on the deer. Since we're concerned with the health of the animal and that's what this system is designed to rank, that is why there, there are deductions. Um, that way abnormal traits do not incorrectly increase the score. So this deer is going to have a gross score of 134 and 5 eighths and a net score of 128 and 4 eighths, which is a tremendous whitetail. So there you have it. That's how to score your whitetail deer. Again, this is a pretty symmetrical 5x5. Five five. Uh, great trophy for any hunter out there. Again, if they get any more complicated than this, any abnormal points, any asymmetric sides, it's best to contact your official measurer. We've got over 1,400 official measures for the Boone and Crockett Club across the country. So if you'd like to find one in your area, click the link below. All right, so now that Luke's got this score chart complete, that is how you score your white-tailed deer. Um, if you come across anything with questions, there's great information on the website, or feel free to email uh, the records department. That, that does come to my department, and we are happy to answer scoring questions, especially for, for new hunters trying to figure out the system. Thanks for joining us here at Hunters Connect and be sure to check out other how-to videos as well as the rest of the history of the Boone and Crockett Club.